Thank you, General Perkins, for your presentation. We'll be looking for some tactical baseball bats to start being issued at TRADOC. <laughs> Hello, mad scientists. In November 2016, the US Army TRADOC Mad Scientist Initiative launched its first science fiction writing competition with the topic Warfare in 2030 to 2050. This contest was open to everyone. We asked writers to contribute ideas outside of what the Army is already considering about the future. And boy, did they deliver. Why did we choose to use science fiction? Sci-fi is important because it creates a space to reframe perspectives and challenge assumptions. Through the art of storytelling, we gain insights into human nature and the relationship between technology, power, and society. Through this, the Army was able to visualize the known, probable, and possible challenges and opportunities that the future holds. We can now update our old assumptions. This comes from an article I recently read entitled, Why Business Leaders Need to Read More Science Fiction by Elliot Pepper in Harvard Business Review. I think this extends to all leaders. Science fiction isn't useful because it's predictive. It's useful because it reframes our perspective on the world. It creates space for us to question our assumptions. Assumptions are a luxury true leaders can't afford. So how did this first contest go? We experienced catastrophic success with over 150 submissions from 10 different countries, USA, UK, Ukraine, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Singapore, Germany, Finland. This diversity in authors presented us with a wide variety of thoughts and ideas on the future operational environment and warfare. Well, what did we learn? We're going to have a new battlefield framework. Through analysis of all of our sci-fi stories, we saw that convergence frequently occurred across numerous technologies. Advances in materials, AI, drones, communications, and human enhancement amplified and drove one another across multiple domains. A major cultural divide and gulf in understanding still existed between different populations, even with developments in technology, like real time in your ear translators. Connectivity and complexity it resulted and presented a number of challenges and opportunities for future forces and populations. Hiders versus finders, competition is ever more important in the future and you're not gonna be able to hide. Additionally, the constant battle for and over information meant victory or failure for each side. Due to snowballing speed and interaction on the battlefield during an in-between high intensity conflict, a number of the military units in the stories required smaller units with large effects capabilities and more authority and operated under flat and dispersed command and control structures. You can find these stories on the watch page where we're live streaming from APAN. Next up is Mr. Matheson Hall. He submitted the winning story called Patrolling in the Infosphere. He is a senior analyst at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab, and he also has had active duty in reserve service currently in the US Marine Corps. It is my pleasure to bring up Matheson Hall, and when he gets up here, we translated his story into a brief video, and thank you for your time. Thank you. The year is 2050. Much has changed. The information environment is rather different. Cube satellites, extreme endurance drones, omnipresent ground-based cameras, and the World Wide Web make secrecy nearly impossible. The world is watching, and now war is the greatest global reality show. Every firefight is a new episode. The perception of events is now key terrain as digital deception can undermine any tactical victory. Precision cyber attacks and electronic warfare are now real-time fires at the squad level. 
soldiers are very different. Connected to their machines through their thoughts and their skin, chemically and genetically modified soldiers become the weapon system. They struggle to absorb the deluge of information inputs, but each soldier, regardless of size or sex, can run 40 miles an hour and leap dozens of feet into the air. Personal angel drones, integrated networks of sensors, and smart munitions extend these soldiers' fields of fires well beyond the human line of eyesight. Despite all these technological enhancements and their global audience, it is still the soldier that wages war. Right, thank you. And I want to thank uh, Allison and Lee especially for uh, organizing and putting together this contest that ultimately uh, resulted in the selection of my story. I also read the other eight finalists that were up on the Small Wars Journal. I thought uh, all those stories were absolutely amazing, so I am uh, honored to have mine selected. I also have to uh, start off by saying I'm about to have some uh, major restorative dental work, which means about two weeks ago I had this stuff put in my mouth, perfect timing, right before I give a, a speech. And I'm still learning how to speak with this in my mouth, so I apologize in advance if I uh, slur and lisp, but this isn't normally how I speak, but uh, nothing I can do about it. And uh, I also need to point out that, as Allison said, this was the first ever United States Army Mad Scientist Science Fiction Contest, and it was won by a Marine. So uh, that's about right. Just want to make sure everybody's aware of that. Uh, if, we want to talk, if we want to talk real infantry, sir, we can, we can do it afterwards. But uh, now I'll go, back. I'll go back to purple now. Um, and, and get into the thoughts uh, that really led to the story and what I was exploring, which I'm more interested in than the actual technology that I, I wrote into the story. And, uh, I, you know, my life, like so many of us, has been dedicated to national security since I was 18. I've spent my entire adult life until just a couple of years ago in the infantry and uh, still am in the reserves. But two years ago, I left active duty and, and started working at Johns Hopkins and was suddenly exposed to a whole new world, not just a higher level policy and operational, even strategic level thinking that I hadn't experienced as a company grade or junior field grade officer, but uh, uh, just this amazing amount of technology out there. And, uh, and, and I'm very interested though in how we apply that to the small unit level, because my passion remains the infantry. So we have all these amazing technologies, we have space, we have ships, uh, unbelievable stuff out there, but what does it mean to the infantrymen, marine or soldier, on the ground out there? And so when I was thinking about this and thinking about the story, there are really four key questions that I was thinking uh, of, and, and this is a lot of what I studied at my civilian job, my day job. And that's how do we integrate all these amazing technologies coming out, whether it's additive manufacturing, artificial intelligence, what have you, into that small tactical uh, uh, unit. And by small tactical unit, I'm really talking company and below. Battalion as well, but company and below. How do we gain and maintain an advantage in the future with these new technologies coming out? And then uh, how do we keep uh, or how do we control these emerging technologies? How do we keep the beasts within the zoo, so to speak, uh, as we go out there and face adversaries who may also have some of these technologies or co-opt our technologies? And finally, what's the future role of the human on the battlefield? I fully agree, you know, the, the, the man or woman on the battlefield, the soldier, the marine, the sailor, the airman, the guardsman, is always going to be key. But as we're rapidly advancing in these technologies, what is the real future there on the battlefield? So technological advances go back to we've started figuring out how to uh, make fire and turn bones into knives and stuff like that. And they've always disrupted the infantry in battle, given one side an asymmetric advantage over the other. Whether it was bronze weapons that you could now have an edge to that allowed certain empires to rise and dominate the battlefield, or chariots coming up in the Middle East, quickly spreading to Egypt and over to China that really supplanted the infantry for a little while when those came out and gave certain empires huge advantages when they adopted those. And then I'm going to jump forward several centuries uh, to advances in metallurgy that also coincided with changes in society that led rise to knights and castles. And now the infantry basically becomes a siege mechanism. But then you continue to have further advances, uh, pikes, long bows, uh, uh, massed arrow fires, and eventually gunpowder that brings an end to the uh, kind of knight and castle siege warfare age and leads to a whole new era of ground combat. And then with mass musket fires, we have close order drill, we have music and flags on the battlefield to control these massive armies trying to mass fires against each other. And then of course we have the rifle, we have the machine gun, we have accurate artillery, 
Uh, we start having motorization. We start having uh, radio out there. And that fundamentally changed the battlefield once again. We go from these massed formations uh, and close order drill to uh, what we now call combined arms maneuver warfare. So as, uh, as I look back over lots of these different advances that uh, came uh, about over the last few centuries, and I'll just stick it to the last 150, 170 years, I was, I was thinking about these new technologies and realized that a lot of times technologies were not only mismatched with the tactics, but they're also mismatched with each other. And I think the Civil War is a, a perfect example. Now, by the Civil War, rifles had already been around for really a couple of centuries, but you couldn't make them to the uh, specifications and mass produce them uh, before about the Civil War and a few other wars in Europe just before this. But now we have mass produced rifles, and we also have a very new invention, the conical bullet. And when you put these two together, along with uh, in improvements in, in artillery, the mass formations on the battlefield are stupid. They're stupid. Yet that's how we still started fighting uh, the Civil War. By the end, by Petersburg, by, we went back to siege warfare, to trench warfare, but it didn't make sense. And you could look back and you say, well, why weren't they figuring out maneuver warfare? Well, how do you do maneuver warfare with, with, uh, without smokeless gunpowder or without the radio? How would you possibly have command and controlled an army at Gettysburg uh, in a somewhat modern sense, employing the rifle in its modern sense without those advances? You just, I don't think you could have done it. Or uh, the classic example, World War II. You had motorization and mechanization. You had flight. You had the radio. The radio had been around for almost 20 years by that point. So why didn't we have maneuver warfare? Why didn't we have combined arms? There was, you, you, the, the technologies were too young. We hadn't figured out how to put them together yet. The radio was too unreliable. So once again, we have a mismatch of technology with itself and with tactics that led, obviously, to mass carnage. So when I think about that, I think about where we are right now. Are we entering a new Civil War era or a new World War, or excuse me, yeah, World War I era where we have this mismatch of these new technologies added to manufacturing drones, artificial intelligence, cyber operations, yet we're still in this uh, combined arms maneuver warfare. Maybe that still is the right answer, but maybe it's not as we continue moving forward. And maybe we're getting to a point where kinetic actions on the battlefield are machine only. Uh, I think we're probably 70 to 80 years away from that, just off the top of my head, but, but maybe not. So maybe uh, we're getting to a point where we need to redefine the role of the human being on the battlefield. And then maybe we need a whole new version of maneuver warfare. And both the Army and the Marine Corps, focusing on the infantry and the ground side in my story, are working on this. In the Marine Corps, we have uh, now the Experimental Battalion, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, designated by the Commandant, which I think is a great initiative. However, also read it, and I think, mm, you know, really they're just kind of testing out new tools and, and new gadgets out there in the battlefield. I'm talking about get rid of the battalion and try something else. I don't know what that something else is, but is there something else that is fundamentally different? Because when I think about it, I think about uh, taking a very competent, good, savvy captain from 1863, and you pluck him out of 1863, and you put him into 1943. I don't think he could figure out how to lead that rifle company, that company commander from the Civil War. Put him in the middle of World War II, you know, give him a few weeks to get caught up. I don't think he could figure out how to do it. It was so different because of the technological changes. He wouldn't be able to comprehend it. Take a good, savvy company commander out of a rifle company in 1943 and put him in a company right now. Some technologies would blow his mind. I mean, our Prick 152s, our satellite you know, radios, our uh, Javelin-guided anti-tank missiles. He would go, oh my god, that's amazing. But I think within a couple of weeks, he would be able to figure out how to run that company. Now, I'm not advocating change for the sake of change, but that concerns me because about the same amount of time has passed. You know, 80 years from 63 to 43, it's been about 74 years since 1943. So are we missing something right here as we go through this? And uh, I skipped uh, past my slide, you know, showing our, our fundamental underlying organizations at the infantry small unit level really haven't changed. So, uh, Talking about my story, uh, I did look at and go through how do you integrate a lot of these emerging technologies at the small unit level. It's about a company, but it really follows a squad on patrol. And uh, I, again, I find these technologies fascinating. I think they're important. I'm surrounded by, I'm not an expert in any of these, but I'm surrounded by people that are and that are developing these, uh, again, in my day job. Everything from human enhancements, human machine integration, uh, human synced artificial intelligence, depending on how you define artificial intelligence, uh, drones. Uh, drone swarms, outsourcing control of drones, uh, persistent cyber and information operations, uh, and that constant competition for an asymmetric advantage. 
Uh, and a lot of these ideas are explored in a lot of other works out there, whether it's uh, uh, you know, Ghost Fleet, that novel Ghost Fleet, which everyone should read, or uh, the recent article in Proceedings by General Allen and Amir Hussein uh, about hyperwar. A lot of people are thinking about this stuff. But what actually uh, drove my interest uh, when I was writing the story was something that we joke about uh, in, my, in my weekend job, and that whole one week in a month, two weeks a year, and the reserve is a complete lie. It's about 10 times that commitment. Uh, as I learned when I made the transition, but I love it. But one thing we always joke about is when we do these plans or we go out on these exer exercises, uh, no, no uh, insult to the higher ranking officers in the room, but the higher ranking officers will say, all right, make sure you integrate cyber and info. And, and we're like, at the company battalion level, what does that mean? Uh, how, integrate cyber? Like, what do, you, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to go out there and write a virus and release it on the internet? Like, what does that mean, integrate cyber? What does it mean to integrate information operations? Uh, you know, you want us to start our own newspapers when we're in these different companies? No, no, that's for PSYOPs. Okay, so what do we do? And as I was thinking about that, I started uh, thinking about how that would apply, again, to that small unit level, company and below, and, and in the future operating environment where we have persistent information, which we're almost already getting there. I mean, we've seen that with the social upheaval generated by iPhone and live streaming on Facebook in just the last couple of years. When you have that, add satellites, uh, it persists to drones, et cetera, uh, I think we need to fundamentally change the way companies, battalions, companies and below are man trained, equipped, and employed. Uh, we need to have cyber and info fires down at the company level. They need to be cleared at the company level. They need to be integrated at the company level. We started experimenting with this with stuff like the company level intel cell uh, that came out in Iraq and Afghanistan, but I think we need to take it to the next step. We need to have reach cap back capabilities. As I think about this, I think about what we all keep realizing over and over again, whether it was the strategic corporal concept of the uh, 1990s or it was the Abu Ghraib uh, issue in Iraq with the soldiers in, in the prison or the Marines urinating in the dead ta uh, Taliban corpses in Afghanistan uh, or Russia today, persistent and insistent Russian uh, misinformation, disinformation, and there's a difference, uh, persistent uh, uh, Chinese messaging in the South China Sea. Uh, that wars are really not won on the battlefield. They're won in the information environment. And they're also more and more being fought in the information environment. Uh, in the Twitter, the Facebook, the YouTube, the uh, Weibo, the Vatonka Net, all that, that's the space where we're fighting and winning or losing wars. Now the battlefield's still very important, but it's going off over there as well. So again, uh, how do we gain and maintain that advantage in this new world? And going back quick through our history one more time, and not to insult anybody's intelligence, but to kind of do the quick review of these concepts of offset strategies. The, what I consider the first real offset strategy, and it wasn't called that, it, so I call it the zero offset strategy, was in General Marshall was told he needed to build 200 ground combat divisions to win World War II, and he said, well, I can't do that. I can build 100. So I'm going to have to counter that uh, with strategic air, the B-17, the B-29. And that was kind of, in my view, and a lot of people's view, the first real offset strategy. But then the first offset strategy, how do we maintain an advantage over our enemy, especially when he has a much larger uh, military with much more stuff, was, that, uh, was uh, Eisenhower's new look strategy and others that fed into that. And I love, this is my favorite, Davy Crockett, nuclear recoilless rifle. But um, really this kind of nuclear uh, force, whether it's nuclear triad, the Army, Pentomic, uh, division experiments, et cetera. And then we move to the second offset strategy, uh, the one we're kind of coming in the tail end on, the precision guided weapons, the network centric warfare, the stealth, the electronic warfare capabilities, which gave us a significant conventional advantage over our enemy, as we saw in Persian Gulf, as we saw, saw in uh, Kosovo and Serbia. However, uh, when we got to the coin fight, not so much. So again, what's that third offset strategy? Well, a few uh, months ago now, or a year ago now, former Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work uh, articulated it and, and followed on Secretary Hagel's articulation of this. Well, it's these emerging technologies, uh, new stealth drones, uh, cyber operations, uh, this kind of uh, basic autonomy on the battlefield. And I kind of have to respectfully disagree because the plans for these are on the computer. And it's very easy to steal those plans. You can download them instantly. And then with additive manufacturing, which we're still at the early stages, I mean, I can make a plastic chess piece right now, but I think we're very close to combining plastic, rubber, metal into it, 
And if I have a 3D printer, and the plans for that are online, and the brains that control this, those advanced uh, uh, thoughts, uh, the brain, uh, or I'm sorry, the advanced uh, algorithms for that are online, and a hacker can just take it, print this, and then input the brains that we've developed over years of research, that's not an offset strategy. That's not, uh, that, that's not what, what's going to give us an advantage over the enemy at all. So uh, you couldn't do that in the previous offset strategies. You couldn't just print a nuclear warhead. You couldn't, uh, I mean, I guess you could steal a nuclear warhead, and there's stories out there whether or not it happened, but you couldn't just kind of download a nuclear warhead and download the guidance systems. You couldn't just download the American army that fought and won uh, alongside the Marines in the Gulf War. You couldn't just replicate that, but now you can. Apparently, we got to Kuwait too fast, but I'll, I'll move on. Um, so, and, uh, and again, that's my concern on that. So, how do we cons uh, control these emerging technologies? Again, if they can be replicated, if they can get out there, how do we control them? Uh, if somebody makes, or if we make a hypervirus uh, in one of our agencies and it gets out on the internet, what are the lasting effects? The lasting effects of that could be as grave as a nuclear strike. I mean, we're starting to get the taste of that with WannaCry and others uh, like that. What happens if it's a true hypervirus or a hyperbiological virus, as in my story, the superbug that was developed in a lab and got out there? And then what happens when uh, the warriors out there or the terrorist warriors, enemy combatants are fighting us in cyberspace aren't soldiers? Uh, what happens, again, as in my story, what happens when there are children in internet cafes around the world controlling drones, killing our soldiers and Marines on the battlefield? Am I allowed to kill them? If I trace this to a house in, in, in wherever uh, city in the world, can I shoot a Tomahawk cruise missile and destroy that house uh, of those that are controlling the drones as combatants on the battlefield? And these questions, we've had similar questions like this before. When gas came onto the battlefield, no one knew how to do this. And we figured it out, although people do violate the laws of war, as they currently are in Syria. When submarine warfare came out, I mean, the, the submarines attacking merchant shipping was the primary driver of us to go into World War I. Uh, we were staunchly opposed to submarine warfare against merchant shipping from 1915 all the way up to 1941. And then on December 8, 1941, we embraced it as official policy. And then uh, strategic bombing of cities, you know, hesitant at first, but then we realized to win World War II, we had to destroy cities. So we've dealt with these uh, concepts or these ethical issues before, uh, but now we have a new set that we're trying to battle uh, our way through. And finally, what's the future of the human being on the battlefield? Again, I, I think there will always be the human on the battlefield, but what does the future look like, especially as autonomy increases? I'm convinced, and I know this uh, will, you know, always gets a lot of people angry, but I'm convinced that the F-35 is probably the last man fighter. Why would I have a man fighter? Other than to guard against somebody breaking into my uplink and gaining control of it. I can see that argument. But if uh, a drone can pull G-forces much harder, fly faster, shoot faster, why have that? Now, I think we'll always have pilots, because I'm not getting into a, a helicopter flown by just a computer. Uh, but uh, you know, what, what is the role of the human on these future battlefields, even enhanced humans, as the battlefields get more and more advanced? Are we going to be there in a civil affairs role, a special forces role, a peacekeeping role? I think so, absolutely, because the human domain is paramount. Human domain, whether it's in cyberspace or on the battlefields, is uh, paramount. Uh, but again, that kinetic fight, what are we looking at? And we should all recognize this, uh, the range of military operations. And I'm curious that by 2050, are we approaching a world where down here is human operations, machine assisted, and here is kind of this human machine hybrid operations, uh, kind of like what my story was exploring, this non-permissive but kind of peacekeeping, civil affairs type environment. And is up here, is that machine operations with human direction? So do we have a human horizon in the range of military operations coming down the pipe in the next 30 or 40 years? Or to uh, just illustrate it one more way, again, uh, the, the, our phases of operations, which uh, I think everybody will recognize, and this kind of dominating activities in the middle, the high kinetic fight, is there a machine operations, human direction uh, uh, blur, blob in there where it's going to be machine led? And are we preparing our units and our training and our manning and equipment and et cetera for that? Now, these arguments have been here before. Uh, in the late 1940s, the Air Force argued uh, that the Navy was really irrelevant and the Marine Corps was irrelevant and the, and the Army really needed to exist to occupy territory once it's uh, taken. And if you looked at uh, the nuclear war in uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, that didn't make uh, mo too much, uh, uh, that made some sense, and they came out the B-35 and others. But again, um, 
they were wrong. Uh, it was wrong. The human on the battlefield was still paramount. But I'm curious if that argument has come back around full circle. Is the future infantryman that? Uh, are we now 30 years away from the future infantryman's actually special forces and civil affairs, and that's the future infantryman? So those were the thoughts I was exploring in the story. Uh, and again, these are the, uh, the four questions that I was kind of asking myself and that hopefully, hopefully the story uh, kind of planted in some people's uh, minds, the bugs playing in their ears. Uh, I think the technology itself, the different tools are amazing, but that really wasn't the point of the story or my motivation for the story. And uh, once again, thank you for the opportunity to talk, and I look forward to meeting you all uh, the next two days. Thanks. Don't, don't go away. Okay. <laughs> don't go away. So in addition to the over 100 people here, there are about 200 people in the chat room and a like number of perhaps even more watching streaming video. So several hundred people watched you help us envision the future. Very powerful stuff. So. I'm Tom Greco, the G2 of Training and Doctrine Command. And when I'm not thinking about problems for General problems. Perkins and Sergeant Major Davenport to solve uh, with the assistance of a great team in TRADOC G2, we think about the future. So when you look at this document, and you, there are four themes which really run through it. And you know, we have four ways that we think about the future. First is we look at trends and the 12 trends we're watching are actually listed in there. We look at crowdsourcing. In fact, we do a lot of that with our partners at OSD. We look at edge cases. So for example, hypervelocity weapons and hypervelocity travel. Within the next decade, you'll probably be able to fly from New York to London under an hour in a plane without a pilot. What are the military implications of something like that? Edge cases. The last is visioning. How do you envision the future? So the 9-11 Commission, kind of play on what General Perkins was talking about, said, and those of you who have been in mad scientists before know, there were three failures. Failure of policy, failure of collaboration, and finally, a failure of imagination. So one of the reasons we had, or the primary reason, is how do you envision a future? What does it look like? And when you heard Allison talking about all the many things we learned from those 150 stories, it was quite remarkable. Well, we took your story and we did that little video, but we also did something else with the assistance of the Army um, Armaments and Research and Development Command at Picatinny, and we have Vince and, um, and Brian here from there, and they used additive manufacturing, 3D printing, of what we envisioned that soldier suit to look like. So Allison, if you would. So that's for you. And that's not all. And that's not all. Allison, if you would read the uh, certificate. Proclamation, United States Army Training and Doctrine Command, Deputy Chief of Staff Intelligence, Mad Scientist, Whereas the Mad Scientist Initiative encourages continuous dialogue and collaboration among academia, industry, government, and non-traditional partners. And whereas the Mad Scientist Initiative identifies tomorrow's key innovations today so the U.S. Army is successful in the future operational environment. And whereas the Mad Scientist Initiative supports Army learning and capability development and whereas Mr. Matheson Hall has provided great and valuable insights and contributions to furthering the mission, goals, and understanding of the Mad Scientist Initiative. Now, therefore, by virtue of the authority vested in me as a JRADOC Deputy Chief of Staff Intelligence, I do hereby proclaim that Mr. Matheson Hall be known henceforth and forevermore as an official Mad Scientist with all the rights and privileges <laughs> pertaining thereto. <laughs> May you always seek the future boldly actively and question conventional wisdom and assumptions and passionately change the status quo. In witness whereof, I hereunto set my hand this 25th day of July, 2017. Thomas F. Greco. Oh. And that's the only time we're going to subject you to having to listen to that proclamation. But we also have. I'll read it to my wife tonight. <laughs> we also have, if you the coin, if I'll, I'll take the coin first. We have our much coveted mad scientist coin. It has our 
brain on a chip. So thank you very much. And then for your lab coat, because every mad scientist must have a lab coat, we have the mad scientist patch. Thank you. <laughs> and then finally, the poster, which is actually quite, quite, quite attractive uh, for this actually f to adorn your walls. Thank you. And so your soldier can look at it. So again, Matheson Hall, thank you very much. Thank you. Great example of a joint effort here where a fine young learning had to come to the army to get your story published. <laughs> <laughs>